fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. One hundred two point three FM Riverside and one hundred five zero AM Palm Springs. Well, welcome back into the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren, Mr. Dave Martino. <laughs> You see, you're you're pausing. You weren't sure what it was going to be, Rose or a little yeah. Palula or whatever that. Yeah, one, what, little Harry what one. The name will be today? Dollarama Dave. Dollarama Dave. That's right. Yeah, he's on speed the dial. Dollar Tree. Yeah, he's on speed dial, and they they call him every time they get movies in that are really bad, yeah. so he can run in there and spend a dollar on, on <laughs> um, a old right. bad movie. Like even the dollar store can't get rid of it. They have to call yeah. Dave. Yeah, they and, call me and. Sometimes they have digital too. Oh my God! For the dollar twenty-five, wow. DVD, Blu-ray, and digital. Geez, they must be really sad, <laughs> sad movies. Yeah. Not even worth a buck. No. no. <laughs> things are looking up. How many thousands of those do you have now? I have hundreds. But hundreds. I have in the low. hundreds, but I know people. I know collectors who are in the thousands. Well, I, I haven't gone over the deep end yet. That's only because your wife won't let you. No, it's true. And when you say, like, when you say collector, I'm sorry, I'm going to burst in. Does that? It's just. Just somebody who's collecting movies from the Dollar Tree or movies in general? Movies in general. Physical okay. media. I didn't know if there was um, <laughs> like a, a subsect of collectors that are like, I'm strictly a Dollar Tree. Well, they might be. They, they might be. would no. be one of them. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, you, you know. Some decent stuff. Yeah. Well, you can get Here things anywhere, right? I mean. Yeah. Dollar Ram or Dollar Tree, you never know. You know, Walmart must be a big day on the weekend for you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of those stores aren't caring, you know, much for physical media anymore. You have to get it online or from you, boutiques. You see, you see, Jennifer, what it is is there's people like Dave, they're into the, as they call it, physical media. Uh, yeah, you know, I will say I owned a comic book store for a oh, while, so yeah. I understand the uh, collector mentality. And I have a, a friend who's a, a big horror collector but he is absolutely obsessed with collecting VHS. Oh, okay, yeah. Like, that's his gig. There are people who still, especially movies that haven't made it to disc or streaming. Yeah, because, because they're that bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and because they're there, you have to have them. Because, yeah. And yet, you know, it was, it was weeks ago when Dave ran to the Dollarama to get the Tanya Harding movie for a book. Yeah. And he still hasn't seen it. No. But that's a great movie. <laughs> it's on the list. I'm going to watch it. Well, there you go. It's on the list. Are, yeah. you, are you scheduled to, to, to watch I, all these? Like, do you, I watched you Bad I, Moms last night. <laughs> that's not something to brag about on the radio, <laughs> oh, right. Dave. I was going to say. Well, I, uh, you know. He was so proud. Yeah. He's, he's, he's such a nice guy. I hate to break, I hate to break it to him. Anyway. I mean, Al makes fun of me when I watch Roadhouse. So this time was well, Bad Moms. Well. I mean, come on. Yeah. See, I'm just trying to get the things out of it. <laughs> I mean, I won't judge you. I love a lot of garbagey TV and movies <laughs> and stuff. Like, I have seen Pretty Little Liars in its entirety four times. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. What? So, yeah, like, I won't, I won't really judge the bad moms thing that much, <laughs> but a little bit. For me, it's not. I'm not judging. I mean, hey, you like what you like. I watch a lot of really bad stuff, too. But I'm talking about running out and buying it. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Not not about it's why do you have to own it? Because even when you watch Bad Moms or let's say the Tanya movie and stuff like that. That's it, then. It'll go back in its case, and it's something else where you have to dust every every month, <laughs> whenever you. Clean. But here's the thing: it's the same thing with books, though. Like I, yeah, you know, like so. It's true. Like I but, just like to look at my bookshelf sometimes. It like it gives me like um, such yeah. calming vibes. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I own these things, yeah. <laughs> and sometimes I will buy it like a book on like a kind like the ebook, and then I'll buy the physical copy because. You know, you just never know if you are going to want to uh, 
leaf through it, underline important passages. That's right. Well, we want it on the shelf. I know. My husband's always like, wait, you have this on audio, ebook, and a hardcover? <laughs> like, how much did you spend just to have, like, three versions of the same book? Everyone wants Jennifer as a fan because she's going to buy all of your media. <laughs> I, I really, I know. People are like, oh, didn't you also get a free copy from the publisher? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the same. I know, it's <laughs> not the same. It has like a slightly different cover. Or <laughs> Yeah. You are the, the grand dam <laughs> of, of horror, right? You are the most beautiful horror writer going. You're oh. famous. Everyone loves you. You're on top of the world. Yeah, It's like royalty in Thank horror. Thank you. Right? This that, is that was Jennifer lovely to say. And Gordon. I mean, what more could you ask for, right? Is there, is there another woman in horror even close? Oh, no, there's plenty. There's plenty of people. Who? Oh, I'm just going to start naming, like, every female horror writer. Uh, Catronia Ward, Cena Paleo. Like, honestly, everybody. Yeah, the, the genre is blossoming with amazing female horror writers these days. Yeah, I love it when women start writing about freaky things. Because I grew up, you know, on strictly Stephen King, Dean Koontz, and Clive Barker. Like, there weren't female horror writers that I could go to my local bookstore and, like, see them. Or their books weren't on, like, the spinner rack at the grocery store and the little mass market paperbacks that I used to obsess about. Except for, like, V.C. Andrews. But even V.C. Andrews was being ghostwritten by a man, so. What's different about a woman horror writer to you? Is it is it the approach? Is it is there something more sensitive about a female horror writer? Um, not necessarily, but I do think for women, there are certain things that are more horrifying to us than like a man. Like so, and I'm and I'm generalizing here, but so sometimes I dabble in a little bit of like body horror poetry, which I love to do, um, and I I tend to write about like gross medical things that would normally only happen to a woman. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a niche subject. <laughs> the whole horror community, do you think it's something that's booming at this time? It, I, I do think it's booming. And, you know, uh, I've talked to my agent, I've talked to other authors, and everyone just keeps saying, you know, horror is having a moment right now. It's having a moment. But it does seem to keep building and building. So I'm hoping, you know, as a genre, it's getting a little bit more respected. I get far fewer people saying to me, oh, I don't read horror these days. When I, you know, when I first started writing, they were just like, why are you writing horror? Like, ew, write a romance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, even my mom, like, she's always just like, you should just write a nice book that people will want to read. I'm like, well, they want to read they want to read my not nice books. <laughs> Some of them do. <laughs> do you think that's still a thing in general? People in public kind of go, well, females shouldn't write horror or gross things or murder or things like that. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I don't see it very often. I, you know, I, I see it a little bit with um, people I personally know who can't still wrap their brain around the fact that I write horror or I write crime and murder books and I like these disgusting things because they, the people in my real life know me as, you know, I'm a ballroom dance instructor. I love the foxtrot. I have a cute little dog. Uh, I wear dresses all the time in bright colors. And then they read my work and they're just like, oh, something must have happened to her. Yeah, who hurt you? <laughs> <laughs> who hurt you like this? I, I just, I don't sort of, you know, because to me, um, a boy and a girl are the same. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, where we, I don't see any difference. So I don't know why a woman couldn't write anything that a man could write in any type. Exactly. You know, horror, crime, fiction, anything. Right. Like it's just. Yeah, I absolutely you know, agree. It's your mind and your heart. It's not. It's not about your sex. So, I, I you know, yeah. in general, I don't. I don't actually understand that because I still hear a lot of people say things like that, or even when I just did like four different book signings here early in August, late July. And I still have people coming up and going, you know, oh, I, and it's funny because they'll say, oh, I could never read this type of book. Yeah. Oh, why? Oh, why? it's just so, it's so awful. Okay. Okay. No, so don't read I, it. Well, I just want to um, say but, yeah. next. 
<laughs> yeah. I know. There's like there's nothing weirder than being at like a convention or a show or even like at a book signing at a bookstore and people come up to you and literally just tell you like, Oh, oh, so this is like dark and scary. Yikes. I hate books yeah. like that. Like I would never read this. And I'm like, oh, okay, thank yeah. you. Do people actually read these books? <laughs> Do you actually make money? Like, I'm like, you wouldn't just like walk up to a random person, like a lawyer, and be like, "Do you actually make money yeah. doing this?" Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do people actually want your yeah. advice? <laughs> yeah, go and go to their job and, and yeah. <laughs> tell them what to do with their job. I, you know. Go to the Dollar Tree and say, "Do people actually yeah. buy these <laughs> movies? <laughs> buy these movies? <laughs> really? Or do they just use them as coasters? Yeah. <laughs> Are they using them for a craft? People project? will actually watch this, do they? Do they? <laughs> oh my god! Nobody watches Bat Moms. Well, no. somebody, somebody. <laughs> no, <does. Right. laughs> I don't know. Sorry, I Dave. Think, I think I think it's one of those things that he just buys, and they're still in the wrapper. They'll be there. And Ten years, <laughs> still in the wrapper. The cat will be sitting on. They depreciate and... in value if you open. Yeah, them. that's right. They're not. They're not. They're original. They'll go down to like seventy-five yeah. cents. Oh, so they're like precious. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I could see that. Golem. Yeah, he just lays in yeah. the basement with all this. Oh, in the of course. Well, it's of the course, basement. you see, of the house of mystery. We're starting to form a new horror book here. You see, it's about yeah. <laughs> Dollarama Dave in the basement with <laughs> his deals. Yeah. Oh my god! Yeah. With his deals, yeah. and he lays there and obsesses. He's just like, uh, like <laughs> Silence of the Lamb. Right? Someone comes to the door. You just like it when he opens the door. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want it to keeps the wrapper on, or it gets the hose. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh there you go. Something See, like you that. Can make a story. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and that brings it up. I'm writing yeah, it down yeah, right now. By all means, got to out, do a quick yeah. outline. <laughs> just, just, yeah, this could work. Actually, so with today's world, what makes a good book to you? Because, like, there's been so much horror from Frankenstein years ago to Anne Rice to now. What, what is a good horror to you? Like, what? How could you? How do you explain what a good horror is? Oh, you know, and I think that's going to be subjective for everybody. Right. Um, for me, I don't know. It's hard to say because I read so much horror and I read so much crime fiction. I just really like the unexpected. And I also really, uh, the past year or so, I've been really, really um, reading a lot of queer horror and and writers that up until a few years ago, didn't really have a seat at the table. They weren't being published as much. So queer horror. Yeah, like Ooh, to me. Ick. <laughs> you would hate Ooh. that. You're like that sounds scary and yeah. gay. <laughs> um, and I'm like that's me. <laughs> oh, don't they don't know that. <laughs> now, now, do you do you consider your horror? Do you consider it um, more on the extreme level? Or do you do more quiet? No, um, definitely more quiet. Definitely, definitely more quiet. Um, I used to call myself just like a gothic horror author, or and then other people would call me literary horror. I definitely, what I like to write, whether it's a story or a novel, I like to write that slow, simmering uh, unease, mm. where you you don't know if the characters are being truly haunted or if maybe they're having a really intense nervous breakdown. Uh, like, is it schizophrenia or is it a ghost? <laughs> well, that's very popular. But when I dabble in, yes, it is. And I love it. And I've always loved it. So, yeah. But yeah, I'm kind of a baby when it comes to, um, like, violence. Like, not seeing it on a movie or reading it in a book, but, like, me physically writing it, I'm kind of a baby. So my, my horror tends to be a little bit more subdued, but then um, aspects of some body horror <laughs> get that kind of go in there too, <laughs> like so. <laughs> so more of the mental suspense of, of, yeah. of the issue and stuff. So what is the Japanese box? So the Japanese box is a collection of uh, several stories and a poem uh, that, you know, the, the story itself, the Japanese box, kind of the flagship story, started actually... Uh, as a personal essay about a night that I was when I was a little kid that my dad showed me all of the stuff that he brought home from the Korean War and uh and he had this Japanese box that he got when he was on leave in Japan and he was like someday I'll give this to you 
So I started writing this essay about my dad and about me and about, you know, what it was like to grow up with, you know, a mom with mental illness and a father with really incredible PTSD. And then I realized it was so personal that that scared me so much that I was like, I have to add a ghost to this. I have to add something that makes it not real as my way of like releasing this information out into the world. So, so that story, which started as a personal essay, ended up turning into like a, like a, a slow simmering unease about a girl being haunted by her dead twin. <laughs> oh, it's, well, what, what draws you to, to put so much person in it, like so much of your own feeling? Yeah, you know, I've spent a lot of the past few years taking a lot of grief writing courses and memoir courses. And um, I taught a course on writing about generational uh, trauma. And I think because I've done so much of my own like personal self-discovery, I've realized how unique every single person in the world is. I mean, I know that sounds stupid to say, but like only I can write the horror or the work that I'm writing. So the more of me that goes in it, the more I can guarantee that nobody's read something like that before because nobody has had my experiences. And maybe I'm lazy and I know my own story, so it's easy to keep telling it. But but how do you let go of that? It's easier than research. Yeah, how can you let go of that? How, you know, it's not like you're just doing the essay for yourself and and you've got it and you work through the feelings and by writing it, you actually put it out for anybody in the world to read. Yeah, that's the like that's the scary part. So honestly, the Japanese box and other stories was the first book that I released that I was absolutely petrified for it to be out in the universe because I kept thinking, like, if somebody hates this. This is the closest to me as a person that I've done for public consumption. So I'm like, if somebody hates it, that means they hate me. And then I just said, you know, I just like took a swan dive and was like, fine, go, go for it. Release it into the world. It helped having a publisher uh, who really was behind the project and believed in it. And then it helped having people I really love and respect uh, read it early and blurbed it. And so it made me less scared to put it out there in the universe right well we, you've gone into your past consciously but have you ever been surprised by anything that you've written that has come out unconsciously maybe after you've you've read the first draft um, yeah i yeah i definitely have and i know i've i've used similar um we'll say like metaphor in certain stories and it wasn't until like later on i was like looking back and going oh that's like a common theme that I'm working with right. uh, and working through. And honestly, sometimes it's happened like when I'm mid interview, like about a book and an interviewer asks like a really important question because they read the book and they're like, did you do this consciously? And I'm like, holy crap, no, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. But that makes me seem much smarter than I thought I was. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you pretend you know what they're talking about. <laughs> yes. I'm like, oh, yeah, that was exactly what I wanted it to be. <laughs> In fact, I wrote that for you. You're right. I am a yeah. genius. <laughs> I wrote it just for you to ask. Yeah. <laughs> Boy. Well, so how does something like this, when you put this together and you put it out there and it's finished now and you look back, how does that change you? I mean, I think I think any time, and this goes for any kind of artist or creative type, when you put the work out there, you are letting, you, it, it's, it's an act of trust. Like you trust that it will be fine. So I really think, you know, every project, you start to trust yourself more, you trust your fans more. Uh, so the relationship is growing, even if it's like you just with like the, with the public in general. Like I, I have to believe in myself and, I'm, and I believe in myself more every time. Oh. Well, and if it fails, you, know, you can always it'll be yeah. at the Dollar Tree. <laughs> yeah, and then Dave can buy it for a yeah. dollar, or maybe a dollar twenty-five if it comes with uh, <laughs> comes with the <laughs> ebook. ebook? Oh, per I'll be right <laughs> it there. It comes with the ebook. It comes with yeah. It's the paperback. It's the hardcover. It's the ebook and the audiobook for a dollar twenty-five. Oh boy, he'll get six. Oh. I'm there. Yeah. For each room. <laughs> yeah. This one doesn't just have to live in the basement. You know, this, this is the bathroom copy. <laughs> I was just going to say, this one goes in the bathroom. The best place to read. Now, I, that's, 
<laughs> I put all my books in bathrooms. That's all I do. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's your my marketing, marketing strategy. strategy. You know what? It's not doing too bad for me. It's the quietest <laughs> room in the house. <laughs> People laugh, but you know what? Every Everybody's house I go to, I just leave them in the bathroom. I carry them with me. <laughs> Do you put them in like uh, bathrooms at like bus stations? Everywhere, and, uh, bus stations, <laughs> shopping malls, restaurants, McDonald's. McDonald's. Even if I don't eat there, I go in and drop it off. Yeah, no, doctors' good. offices. This is and, a grassroots yeah, marketing. And, and you know, it's uh, not doing too bad. You know, my numbers are okay. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever started a story like this or a story and um, it kind of like when you? Uh, how is this? When you when you get a beginning of a story and you're going to write about it and you start putting it down on paper, you have some idea of where it's going to go or what you want to say to people or kind of what the story is, kind of a basic premise. But by the time you finish that, has it ever been completely different? Yeah, my book, Pretty Ugly, which I think I was on your show talking about it a couple years ago, um, I went into writing Pretty Ugly thinking it was going to be a rom-com about the end of the world where people's like um, flesh was rotting off their body because of a, a terrible disease. And I, for some reason, I thought that was going to be really funny. Um, <laughs> this was before COVID. <laughs> so, uh, so I thought, hilarious, um, a global pandemic that's killing everybody, but these two wacky kids are going to fall in love. Uh, and as I was writing it, it definitely changed completely into this like really kind of beautiful story about uh, healing childhood trauma and it still took place at the end of the world where people's uh, bodies were rotting off but but it, it it did lack the comedy of the rom-com that I thought I was going to be writing yeah and my husband just kept saying like I thought this was supposed to be funny when he was like reading my early drafts and I'm like don't you think it's kind of funny and he's like no <laughs> no it's actually really sad and kind of disgusting <laughs> he's like I love it but He's like, it's just not the book that you pitched to me. <laughs> I was just like, here, yeah, read my rom-com. Yeah. Because I'm a kind of a pantser, so going into something, it, it can easily change. It can very easily change. Yeah. Like, I'm working on a project right now that I I can say this because it is, doesn't resemble this at all anymore. I wanted to do, like, a female American psycho but set in a ballroom dance world. And I can tell you that it is not that at all anymore. <laughs> it is still takes place in the ballroom dance world, and there are murders. But uh, it is not uh, about a female psychopath. Mainly because my agent was like, do not make your main character a psychopath. Do not make her a murderer. No. And I'm like, what if she just murdered a couple people? And she's like... <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> Please don't do that. I want her to be likable. I'm like, she's pretty likable, even as a killer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you can always have her boyfriend work at the Dollar Tree, and he's killing yeah. people yeah. every time someone comes in and buys something. <laughs> you know, buys yeah. If they don't take his movie recommendations, <laughs> right. he's yeah, that's like, right. he goes after them. Kills them out back by the that's dumpster. Right. <laughs> oh, terrible. Do, do, do you ever put a purpose or some sort of meaning in your books oh yeah yeah i mean i think because so much of me is in the books it would i i can't say no there's no purpose or meaning in the books at all i do i do write a lot about mental illness and um struggling with reality and and past trauma and healing from that or trying to heal from that but you know kind of not being able to because yeah, it's a horror novel. So so obviously wackiness ensues. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I do tend to write about um like grief, trauma, mental illness, ghosts, drownings. <laughs> so the fun stuff. Yeah. All the fun stuff. All the fun stuff. Alcoholism. You know, people are just like, Why do you write about these things? I'm like, Have you met my family? <laughs> like <laughs> almost all of my female relatives are schizophrenic. Like, hello. <laughs> It's got to come out somewhere. Right. I can't afford therapy. <laughs> <laughs> we were just talking about uh, uh, stories change, you know, how your stories change. And I was just wondering, what do you think drives that change? Is it the characters? Oh, it is the characters. It is the characters. There's, you know, I remember when I was writing my very first book, uh, my debut novel, Beautiful, Frightening, and Silent, I was typing away. And then my main character, Adam, made a choice. I can't say it because it's a spoiler. He makes a choice. And I, and he made the wrong choice. I mean, the right choice for the book, 
but it wasn't at all what I thought was going to come out of my fingers as I was typing. And the second I typed it, I just, I screamed. I was like, no. And my husband ran in and he thought I saw a mouse or something. And he was just like, what's going on? And I was like, Adam, just blah, 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 blah. And he's like, okay. And I'm like, and it's the, it's, he shouldn't have. And he's like, well, just delete it. And I'm like, I can't now. Yeah. It's on the page. It happened. He made that choice. He made the wrong choice. Uh, <laughs> like now and nothing is going to go well for him. <laughs> so are these characters, uh, how do you experience them? You know, remember when I said all of my relatives were schizophrenic? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so I went to school. This is a long winded answer. I went to school for theater. Uh, that's what I went to college for. So I did a lot of um, character development for every character I played, whether it was a scene or an entire play or anything. So I always start there. Like I, I'll usually have a rough idea of a, I hate, I hate to use the word plot because um, it's not even, it's not even that sometimes, but like a, a, an idea, a concept. And then I just try to figure out who's there, like who's, who are my players? And then I just spend time in my head figuring out everything out about them. Uh, and I always start with what are their five core memories of their life so far? Like if they were dying, what are the five things that would flash in front of their eyes before they died? Uh, what are the things that shaped them? And I start there and then sometimes the story just starts working itself out from there. When you figure out what is the most important thing to a person what is the most heartbreaking thing that ever happened to them? When were they the most scared? What is the worst thing they think they've done in their life? And then, you know, if it's going well, the book starts writing itself. And if it's not going well, then I haven't figured out really who they are yet. Because once I know them, I, it's easier to, to figure out what they would do. Do you hear your characters? I'm just trying to find out if you're hearing voices. <laughs> I'm not hearing voices. I, But I do. Like, but at night before I go to bed, I will, like, tell myself the story of like their lives or even the story of the book or the story in my head over and over again until I fall asleep. And when I get to a point where I don't know what happens, I go right back to the beginning and I start again, tell myself everything I know. And eventually I get past that point where I don't know what's going to happen and the story just happens. Hmm. So it's almost like I don't hear them per se, but I do see them like a movie in my head. And then I have to figure out, you know, how to describe what I'm seeing. Does that happen? Does anyway, that happen to you when you're driving or? <laughs> no. Okay. Just, just curious. I would make stay off the roads in that part of the world. Yeah. 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 I was going to say, I mean, luckily I work at home. Most <laughs> <of them. laughs> yeah. the, at the end of the day, when you, when you do a book and you put it out there, um, what's the most important thing for you to happen? Honestly, it's hearing back from readers about their experience, especially if it's positive. If you have a negative experience with my books, um, please don't personally email me and tell me. Thank you. Yeah, um, just give the email I, address. That's yeah. what I do. That's what yeah, I does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, like I, so for the Japanese box, which just came out uh, August 1st, I was really thrilled. Um, I, you know, I have like, I have some fans that um, who are just so supportive and so incredible. And they've reached out to me with their experience reading it, how much they loved it. And I'm like, oh, please leave a review on Amazon. Like, I can't copy and paste your private email into the. <laughs> but yeah, just connecting with, with your readers on an emotional level and not just like, oh, I loved it. It scared me because, I mean, that's that's all well and good. I, I do. I want to hear that, too. But but when I when I hear from even if it's just one person that they tell me what the work meant to them um, and how it moved them, then that's what I want. That's exciting. I was going to say you got you, Josh Melman wrote a, a spiel for you, right? And, and I, you know yeah. I had to sleep so, with him for him to do one for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I will say the day I I love Josh. We're we're friends, and when I said, "Hey, will you will you read my?" book and and if you don't hate it could you blurb it he was like yeah yeah i'll definitely do that and then i didn't hear back from him for a while and i'm like oh he read it and he hated it and he's too embarrassed to mention it to it me in bathroom. Uh, <laughs> i know he put it in his bathroom uh he put it in the cat's litter box <laughs> uh but no and then one day he texted me and he was just like oh i'm about to start reading your book right now 
And I was like, I'm going to throw up. <laughs> I was so nervous. I was so, so nervous because I'm just like, what if he hates it? He's one of my favorite authors in the world. Why did I give it to him? He's going to know I'm terrible and stupid and crazy. And then as he was reading it, he was like messaging me while he was reading it. His favorite lines. I love this part. Blah, 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 blah. So like that entire day, I was just like such an emotional roller coaster for me because I was just like, he's going to hate it. And I'm like, holy crap, he doesn't hate it. And, uh, and, and he said in a, in a message to me, and I'll never forget it. It like changed my life. He said, this book makes me want to be a better writer. Wow. And I'm like, well, you're like the best writer I know. So that's crazy. Yeah. So he was very generous and, and lovely. And, and wow. yeah, he, he gave me a really spectacular blurb. And then, and then again, in our messages, he's just like, he's like, blurbs are so weird. He's like, what I really just want to say in all caps is I effing loved this book. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, well, you can say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> You could say that. So he thought he was sending it to Stephen King. That's all. <laughs> yeah, he was just like, "Oh wait, oh no, oh, wrong, wrong person." <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry. I this, thought this was this was not meant for you. <laughs> what? Well, sorry. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. What I wanted to say to you was um, great effort. Yeah, great effort. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Keep up the good work. <laughs> well, that's that's good, um, but I think I'd be happy with that. I mean, he's he's yeah. he's on top of the world right now in horror. And uh, do you ever think of your stuff as want? Do you ever want any of your work to become like a movie or something on Netflix or some streaming s service? Do you ever you ever come yes. across that? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I do want that, especially. Um, Honestly, like my, my debut novel, Beautiful, Frightening, and Silent, I just always think, because it's, it's three characters, and most of it takes place like in an old house. And I, and I was just like, it would make such a great independent film, because you don't need a huge cast, you don't need a big budget. It's very claustrophobic and atmospheric at the same time. So I always picture, picture that book as a movie, because I think, you know, it would be the easiest to film because it doesn't involve people's body parts rotting off their <laughs> so we wouldn't need a makeup artist <laughs> yeah, smell o rama scratch and sniff on <laughs> oh my god scratch and sniff so that's this is now the second time scratch and sniff has come up in my life in the less than a week so now i feel mm. like i have to be on the lookout for the third time i on my podcast i said i wanted to do a, a like a scratch and sniff episode where we would like mail out scratch and sniff stickers to uh, <laughs> our loyal viewers and be like, now it's time. Mm, we're drinking coffee. <laughs> <laughs> you know what to do. Scratch and sniff. And my co-host uh, was like, that is a terrible yeah. idea. Yeah. Please don't bring that up again. <laughs> I don't know. But you just said scratch and sniff. And now I'm thinking maybe that's I a think sign. I like it. I don't know. <laughs> Well, you see, I've been, I've been, I do a lot of, I'm in the old movie era right now and old TV shows because I'm writing stuff in the 60s. So that's all I'm watching is 1950s and 60s it. horror, noir, science, science. Oh, I love that's it. That's all that's on my TV and game shows. That's all that I do 24 <laughs> seven. I know shows. it's that people think I'm weird. Well, I am, but that, <laughs> that's, but you think the thing is, it's so important to get into the, the era. Of what yes. you're writing about, you know, what's important, the jokes. Because every time they say and do something or mention a name and I don't know it, I've got to find out who it is. Why do they all laugh about this person? What's the joke? What's going on? Because that's right. what you incorporate into the, to make it, yeah, make it real. it's real. It's that time. It's important and stuff like yeah. that. But they had, they, they were trying that for a while in the 50s or 60s. I'm not sure which now, where they were doing the smell o -rama. I remember, like, so I used to be completely obsessed with, um, like, so when I was a kid, Nick at Night, Nickelodeon, yeah. after, like, t like 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. at night, the, all they did was show, like, old TV shows from the <laughs> 50s and 60s. And um, even as a child, I was a total insomniac, so I would just, like, stay up and be like, I'm watching, like, Car 54, where are you? And, <laughs> you know, just, like, really random bad shows, I'm like. It's not all Bewitched and I Dream no. of Genie. There were some clunkers oh, yeah. out there, uh, but I loved them. So I, I, I think that's probably what like shaped my like absolute love of like the fifties and sixties aesthetic. It's how I dress. 
like very, <laughs> it's just, I love it. They knew how to uh, display something, how to get an effect. Yeah. You know, they knew how to do it with a lot less, you know, of the special effects that we have now are computerized. They were able to create mm -hmm. an emotion with just a, a, a look, a feel, uh, an angle. Yeah. With lighting, yeah. with shadows. Yeah. Oh, like now I'm just like, oh, I want to rewatch my favorite movie, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, it's true. But so that's important to me. And, and so when you when you are putting together a scene in one of your books, how is it that you make it become real? Again, I start with the emotion of the characters. And sometimes I try to find music or a song that embodies what they're feeling. Like, again, like, so in my brain, it's like, if this were a movie and there was no dialogue, just watching people go through their day-to-day -day lives, no dialogue, what would that soundtrack be? And I figure out that song and then I'll play that song over and over again in my head. And I just, I watch my characters in my head doing the things that happen in between the scenes of the book. Like, just like when it's not the plot, when it's how they get ready for work, how they walk down the street. And then I just try to ride that scene, that not scene, that them walking to work, them walking down the street, them going to the store, into whatever's happening, like in the book itself. And to me, that makes it feel very real for me. And, and I think, again, this comes back to, like, I went to school for theater. Uh, the person who was the head of our program would, you know, before class some days, he would just sit in his office and he would, like, watch everybody get out of their car and walk into the building. And, and he would talk about how we, we as people were, are our most interesting when nobody knows, like, when we don't know we're being watched. So he would kind of shape our class that day based on what he saw of our mood, our body language as we were just walking to the building. So that's, I guess that's what makes my characters and my scenes feel real for me is I think about what they're doing right before the scene, the things that are supposedly not important. He was probably a creep and he was touching himself while he was watching. <laughs> No, he was lovely. I know. I, every time I like say that story, people are like, "That is so weird." And I'm like, Norman Bates. I'm like, no, he was actually very lovely. Yeah, and he was in his office with like his mother, who he had. <laughs> and then he was like, "Mother, look how interesting my students yeah. are. Mother, look at them. Look at them, mother." And then he would hold her up yeah. to the window. Oh, look at Jennifer walking from her car. It looks like she had a bad day at the yeah. bookstore. <laughs> She looks like a whore. <laughs> she looks like a whore today. I see. Why is her lipstick yeah. smeared? What was she doing right before she oh, got mother, here? Oh, mother, stop yeah. it. <laughs> stop it. Stop it, mother. She's a nice yeah. girl. <laughs> this went mother, off the rails what have you quick. done? What have you done? <laughs> what have you done? I, I can see it now. It's taken off. This is a new, new, whole new series going on. Yeah, I'm not going to write the Dollar Store Dave story no. anymore. I'm going to write yes. this one. Well, I mean, I, I would do the Dollar Store Dave one anyway, just in case. Maybe combine the yeah. two. Have it as the opening act. Somehow. I mean, you know, you got to have yeah. Dollar Store Dave. <laughs> <laughs> he sits in his car, his old Pinto, beat up Pinto outside the yeah. park. And the backseat is filled with DVDs. Yeah. And he's watching people <laughs> go in stickers. and out of the store. Oh. And he's like... Oh, she reminds me of that scene in Hello, Mary Lou, Prom Night Two. Too. And then he like <laughs> he sifts through he sifts through the the back seat and he pulls out like the DVD yeah. copy still uh -huh. wrapped in plastic, of course. Yeah, and he rips it open. Yeah. He's like, I'm gonna watch you yeah. tonight. He rips it open with his teeth and then he starts to breathe heavy like Mel Gibson. <laughs> get a get an old portable <laughs> DVD player in the car. Yeah, in the car. I have to watch Ow. you right now. <laughs> I can see it. I need it that now. That would be really good. I think yeah. this is turning into something really, you know. It is <laughs> working. Real. This yeah. could be a special. <laughs> now write that down and send it to Josh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Josh, I have this great idea. Holes and, movie. <laughs> Holes and everything's blocked. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, that's weird. That's, that's weird. weird. And we're not we're not friends anymore on Facebook. That's, I've been blocked, deleted, and blocked. Yeah, I don't know what's going on? <laughs> so where, where do you see yourself going? You're not going to write romantic comedies, obviously. So how far do you want to go with uh, horror, or do you want to go into another area? I mean, so I feel like I have 
I have horror stories still inside of me that are that I I want to tell. I have several like crime crime stories, like crime adjacent. You know, I like I I jokingly called it to somebody uh, a friend of mine. I was like, it's like I kind of want to write these book club books, but instead of it being like wine moms just drinking it's like wine moms drinking but then there's a murder and then there's this or then there's like a serial killer and they're like mm, that's not really a book club book if you keep <laughs> adding these gross things to it so yeah i think you know my wheelhouse is a lot of is always going to tend to be darker so horror crime and even if i dabbled in memoir i i still like the the personal essays i write have a lot of like horror imagery in them so they still fit in the the horror place horror universe yeah it's interesting and that universe is the like oh what happened to you as a child Who hurt you? <laughs> <laughs> your parents should have hugged you yeah. more <laughs> what do you want people to get out of your writing um that's such a great question and i'm like i love that like we we have this fun conversation we're laughing and we're joking and then you ask these like Really, oh, yeah, it's the best way. So, what you do I want? <laughs> yeah, where I'm like, oh yeah, no, I, I do it. On oh purpose. no, you want me to be vulnerable? That's... You're like Barbara nice. Walters. That's... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what type of a tree would you be? Uh, <laughs> I know. Oh god. So, what do I want people to get out of my work? Um, because my my work tends to be on the emotional side. Uh, I would like people to realize that they are not as alone as they probably think they are. That's my, my touchy-feely answer, okay. but it is well, true. Who have you killed in your books or tortured from your real life? Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> we won't yeah. tell anyone. Oh, I will say, so I have a, a work in progress right now that, like, the one that I originally said was going to be American Psycho in the ballroom dance world. It still exists in the ballroom dance world, and I will say maybe some former employees at like uh, the Fred Astaire I worked at for a while, a million years ago. Maybe some of them, maybe, maybe an ex of mine <laughs> might die <Yeah. laughs> or somebody similar to them. But that being said, there's a character based on my husband and I have done like really, I've made him not a nice person and he was reading it and he's just like, really, <laughs> <laughs> really? And I'm like, what? I had to make it not exactly you. He's like, but this scene was exactly how we met, and then all of a sudden I'm doing something creepy. I'm like, well, yeah. Yeah, we have your husband on the other line right now. So it's <laughs> <laughs> He's going to be like, yeah, I really wish you hadn't named me blah, blah, blah. In that book. Uh, he knows nothing is off limits. <laughs> well, that's the whole idea if you're married to a writer, you know. Anything no. can happen, you know. Yeah. <laughs> is, so how does this world um affect you when oh you're my writing? god i mean because it, it seems to me the last we can say almost 10 years it's it's been getting more bizarre as it goes and lots mm -hmm. of weird things going on and weird stories and everything going on from politics to you name it and um with all of that wild stuff going on do you think that affects your you know your emotion to write or do you think it makes it darker or lighter or do you think um you know? you know for weirdly so for me i think it, it makes me darker and it also makes what i'm searching out to read and like consume with my eyeballs so like movies and tv shows um it, it, it's everything gets darker for me because i don't know why but i've always found things like true crime documentaries or true crime books to be very relaxing for me it's how for many years, like since I was in high school, I dealt with a lot of anxiety. Like I would just go like, I'm just going to watch a murder documentary and I'm going to feel better mm -hmm. because I, oh, I know it's completely messed up and not healthy, but I think it's because like when I get really anxious, if I watch something or read something that's really dark and horrible, part of me goes, see, it's not that bad. Sure. The world is on fire, literally and figuratively, uh, things are not going as great. There's a, you know, a plague, there's all of these things, but at least there's not currently in my town, uh, a plague of vampires who are killing people every night, or there's currently in my town, knock on wood, not a serial killer who, 
um, snatches women on their way to their mailboxes that are at the end of their very long, dark driveway and does terrible things to them. So I always like go to really dark things and it makes me feel better. So yeah, the world is really almost dystopian right now. So I think that is what's, I think this might be why horror is having a moment, why uh, the crime community is doing better, like the crime writing community, they're doing better than they ever have. You know, there's, there's a weirdly a need to see something worse than what you're actually seeing in your real life. <laughs> it's not healthy, but I think it is what it is. <laughs> I was going to say, that sounds like fun. Let's go for ice cream. Let's go for murder. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go for yeah. murder. I mean, ideal night would be like, go get some ice cream and then watch a murder documentary. Well, there you go. For see, me. now here's, here's the clue. You know, you can make. And wear your 1950s yeah. dress. And well, I do anyway. But, everything's fine. Um, <laughs> but you should have you should have like blood red ice cream. Oh, create yes. some flavors of ice cream. You know, like the Gacy ice cream. <laughs> this. Oh my god, <laughs> disgusting! <laughs> that was a birthday cake flavor, <laughs> of course. Of course. But um, yeah. Oh, just got, I'm like getting like uh, I feel like I just got diabetes saying those words. Birthday cake flavored ice cream. Oh yeah, I tell you. But and like the. Ch- like the cherry on top would look like the clown yeah. nose. <laughs> Bonus clown with oh. bridges. Yeah. <laughs> he watches you yeah. eat. <laughs> he paints a picture Smiling. of you eating your ice Smiling. cream. Drew. Oh, hello, little girl. Oh, <laughs> this is sick. You know, there been a dollar around. What's wrong with you, Alan? Alan? Yes. Anyway, <laughs> so let's, where, where do people find you? I know you're hidden out somewhere and. You know, and yeah, I live at, you know, like they can't actually physically find me because nobody would even be able to see my driveway where up my car. I live in this crazy old You live in an old monster uh, house, don't you? I really do. I mean, it looks a lot like that. It's, it's a, it's dark, dark brown. It has a tower that has, <laughs> you know, it, I mean, it you really does. You see it getting it cloudy and thunder and rain coming in and, <laughs> and Jennifer running to the window. Oh, look, it's going to be a beautiful yeah. day. It's going to be a beautiful day today. <laughs> um, and I do have a, a not haunted mannequin that I had set up in my writing tower for a while, like total America, like a total psycho Norman Bates's mom, like put her there <laughs> in the corner. Cause I wanted like the Amazon delivery drivers to uh, pull up and just be like, what the hell is happening in yeah. that house? Um, but then she started freaking me out. So <laughs> anyways, uh, where you can find me online is the easiest place is my website, which is www.jenniferangordon.com, and that's Anne with an E, like Anna Green Gables. That has links to all of my social media. I am not active on TikTok. No. Okay. <laughs> I was like, um, I just think, I, I don't know. I think I would be bad at it. Like, I would either take myself too seriously, or it would just turn into like thousands of videos of me teaching people the Foxtrot basic. And I don't think, um, I think it would work for my career. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know I really should, but I, I don't love social media that much. So every time I have to like add another site, I'm like, Oh no. Um, like I'm not active on whatever Twitter is now, but I am active on Facebook and Instagram Especially if you like pictures of dogs. That's mainly what my Instagram is. You were going to say dolls. <laughs> oh, there are some mannequin photos and some photos of my, I do own, for some reason, I bought a bunch of doll houses. And I thought, in all my spare time, I'm going to turn this into like a haunted doll house. And now I just have a bunch of doll houses that are not haunted. Oh, not yet. <laughs> yet. Yeah, not yet. You have a time. Well, there you go. Now, now, everyone, you got to get out and buy the Japanese box. It's the new Jennifer Ann Gordon book, and the reason is, is the poor girl. She she needs you to go out and buy it. Okay. She's, I need it, please, she's, please. Alms for the poor. Yeah, she's she's getting in trouble here. I'm like a little matchstick yeah, girl. She's getting in trouble. <laughs> But it's, instead, it's she, books. You know, she she wants to quit her job at the taller round so that she doesn't have to see <laughs> Dave every day. That's right. He comes in sometimes three times oh, a yes. day. Sometimes, and I'm like, Dave, why do you now smell like milk <laughs> and cheese? Where did you go for the last two hours? And he's like, 
I was just sitting in my car <laughs> in pinto. eating some old Little Caesars pizza in the Pinto watching Hello Mary Lou Prom Night right. 2 on my portable DVD yeah. player. Yeah. Like, I don't know where the milk snow came from. That's just how I said it. I followed that girl home. And, uh, oh, uh, no. uh, uh, anyway. Oh, poor, poor Dave. Man. Dave, you've been a... Poor Dave. You've taken a lot of abuse. <laughs> and I didn't know that... I didn't know that's why you were on that's the show exactly today. That's exactly why I'm but, on. But... But but Alan messaged me earlier and he's like, oh, Dave is there to be yes. abused, and I'm like, does he like it? And he said, oh, <laughs> <laughs> and I yeah. was like, all yeah. right, I'm super nice, so I don't like to do things like that. But no, no. Yeah. all right, no, he's 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 got his he's got his. Uh, <laughs> Everybody has yeah, their kinks. No, he's I'm a his, glutton for punishment. <laughs> yeah, he's got his table out there and he's got his nipple clamps on. <laughs> Oh, this is terrible. Anyway, um, well, we appreciate you being here. Delete everything after everybody's got yeah. their kinks. <laughs> well, thank you. You're like, no, we're opening. Yeah, we're opening. Yeah, that's the, usually open with the hard nipples. That's so the that's cold that's open. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Well, Jennifer Ann Gordon, thank you for being here. Alan R. Warren, thank you for having me. Dollar Store Dave. Thanks, Jennifer. <laughs> Pleasure. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.